Hello and welcome to the News at 10 on NTA News 24. We are reaching you live from the nation's capital city, Abuja. I am Dennis at Digunloye. Here are the headlines. President Buhari decries poor showing on over 6 trillion Nara investments for 19 years on NDDC. Vice President Yemi Oshim battle tasks African governments on right policies towards actualizing African continental free trade area. All right, uh, apologies for that uh, freeze in the picture, but let's kick on with the news. And uh, Vice President Yami Oshimbajo has called on authorities across the African continent to take the right policy actions towards actualizing the African continental free trade area, which he notes offers limitless opportunities for the industrialization of Africa. The Vice President stated that such actions include the protection of local industries and improved value chains. This was contained in a message delivered this Thursday at a round table on industrialization in Africa themed positioning African industries for economic transformation and continental free trade, organized by the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria. We must ponder on how industrial policy will benefit from the African continental free trade area. For certain, the free trade agreement itself is indispensable if industrial development is to take off in Africa because it offers wider markets and, econ and economies of scale which are essential for manufacturing to be competitive. So the crux of my message today is that we must take policy actions to create an environment in which business can thrive. To start with, we must adopt the right type of macroeconomic and industrial policies. It's important for African governments to provide a stable macroeconomic environment. I, I call on AU member states to ratify and implement the protocol on free movement of persons, right of residence, and right of establishment. Vice President there speaking earlier. Now about 6 trillion Naira was allocated to the Niger Delta Development Commission in the last 19 years with very little to show for the investment. President Mohamed Buhari stated this in his message to the submission of the forensic reports on the NDDC which the Minister of Justice Abu Bakar Malami received on his behalf. Femi Okewo has the report. Sometime in October 2019, Governors of the Niger Delta region visited President Muhammad Buhari, bemoaning the large number of abandoned projects of the Niger Delta Development Commission. At that time, they thought the abandoned projects numbered between 9 to 10,000 projects. This was what subsequently led the federal government's composition of a forensic audit team, which has now revealed to Nigerians that there are 13,077 NDDC projects abandoned in all the nine oil-producing states of the country. President Buhari, in his message, pledged that his government will use this report as a turning point for the people of the Niger Delta area and Nigerians generally. Is also concerned with the multitudes of Niger Delta Development Commission's bank accounts amounting to 362 and lack of proper reconciliation for the accounts. Minister of Niger Delta Affairs reiterated the commitment of government to removing the various forms of impediments to the development of the region. The intention of this exercise is not to wish on delivery or any organization. The intention has always been to correct the wrongs of, of the past. A team of 16 forensic auditors had been commissioned by the federal government to dig into the activities of the NDDC since its formation in 2000. Because of the security implication of the audit, the federal government also raised a joint security team to give the auditors cover anywhere they went. In Abuja, Femi Okewo, NTN News. Federal and state governments have expressed overwhelming support for an initiative by the 
AFDB to create special agro-industrial processing zones through public-private partnerships. The program aimed at developing priority value chains through developing infrastructure in rural areas will focus on finishing and transforming raw materials and commodities. Justin Bem, Unyi reports. At a high-level briefing session, Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Zain Ahmed, who hosted the meeting, reaffirmed the federal government's commitment to put in place enabling policies and incentives to attract private sector investment in the zones to ensure successful implementation. Participants, which include representatives of the African Development Bank Group, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD, and the Islamic Development Bank, provided progress updates on the scheme following their consultations with key stakeholders within the public and private sectors. The AFDB confirmed that it is in collaboration with other development partners mobilizing $520 million to co-finance the first phase of the program in Nigeria and implementation in phases across the six geopolitical zones. Director General of the African Development Bank's Nigeria Country Department, Lamin Barrow, said the zones would be rolled out in 18 African countries, including Nigeria. The Nigeria Special Agro-Industrial Processing Zone Program consists of four mutually reinforcing components, infrastructure development and agro-industrial hubs management, agriculture productivity and production, policy and institutional development, and program coordination and management. The federal government confirmed that all 36 states in Nigeria and the federal capital territory would be eligible to participate in the SAPS program. In addition to the federal capital territory and seven states, Kaduna, Kano, Kwara, Imo, Cross River, Ogun, and Oyo participating in phase one, several other states have indicated interests in the SAPS program. These include Bauchi, Lagos, Niger, Jigawa, Ekiti, Lagos, Taraba, Benue, Sokoto, Ondo, Nasarawa, Gombe, and Kogi. Special Agro-Industrial Processing is a flagship initiative of the African Development Bank's Feed Africa Strategic Priority that aims at providing end-to-end -end solutions and services that de-risk production processing and marketing operations of private sector actors as they boost manufacturing and transformation capacity in production areas. Justin Bemuni, NTA News. The Nigeria Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, NATI, is poised to ensuring revenue accruable to governments from the extractive industry is remitted when they become due. The agency is ensuring this through collaboration with anti-corruption agencies, including the Independent Corrupt Practices Commission, ICPC, in Abuja. Benny Adams reports. The handshake, the pen on paper, binds the agreement that seeks to increase revenue and grow fat the national purse. Our intervention is nothing more. It is to free resources in the extractive industry to support government, have more resources to construct roads, build a transport system for the country, be able to create an enabling environment for jobs to flow, tackle insecurity, and then be able to provide an enabling environment for citizens of our country to enjoy the resources by all, not just a few. For both anti-corruption agencies, the Petroleum Industry Act provides better grounds for maximizing the potential in the extractive industry. We can use such information uh, to improve uh, on, on the application and the use and implementation of our own statutory mandate. So I think that uh, you can expect uh, maybe stronger bite from this uh, collaboration. The agreement centers on information sharing, prevention and prosecution of defaulters in the oil and gas as well as the mining sector. In Abuja, Benny Adams. NTA News. Minister of Mines and Steel Developments Olamilekon Adigbite has flagged off the commencement of airborne geospatial information gathering systems to discover more solid mineral resources. Two aircrafts have been commissioned for this purpose to be active in 19 states in the northwest and eastern parts of the country.
The rest of the aircraft is equipped with electronic sensors, which will pick up variations in uh, particularly magnetic changes and radiometric changes in the ground. Processing the data, we can try to interpret what the geological structures are in the ground. And it's from those structures that we can tell where the likely mineralization may occur, which will then involve further uh, detailed study. As part of the World Bank program, that is headquartered in the Mindaiva in the ministry. So somebody who can picture it's about 15 story building. So from the ground you see the aircraft, you hear the noise and all that. And so when these aircraft are flying at low altitude, and because of their peculiar color, the yellow, people will not panic because they'll come very close to the ground. So basically they are there to gather data. And of course, this data will enhance our ability uh, to know what minerals that we have and thereby attract the right investors into the sector. More of such aircraft are expected to be deployed to regions with deposits of such economic potentials. Now, as delegates to the 64th UN WTO Commission for Africa syndicates come up with a common position that will strengthen tourism and investment in Africa, voices of African ministers are echoing loudly for respect for the continent by the developed world. Anthony Forson in Sao Island, Cape Verde, now reports. Since Nigeria's Information and Culture Minister, Lai Mohamed arrived in South Island in Cape Verde, it has been one meeting after another. On the agenda is how to carry the continent along given the devastating effect of COVID-19 pandemic on tourism around the world. And so, it has been resolved that three key issues will be marshaled to protect the continent in growing the sector. In particular, the issue of you know, vaccine. Uh, it was the consensus of all the African ministers present at this meeting that we need to speak with one voice and let the world know that they are being unfair to Africa, especially in the area of vaccine. Uh, that while other parts of the world, especially Europe and the US, are even thinking of a third, you know, uh, vaccine, a booster vaccine, most countries in Africa are yet to attain 5%, you know, vaccination of their population. So we also resolve that the issue of uh, connectivity must be addressed within the African context, that we must work towards making it possible, you know, for connectivity to be easy within the African continent. Another issue that was discussed is the issue of travel advisories. Uh, we believe that uh, these travel advisories must be considered in the sense that uh, when there's a small issue in Africa, uh, this uh, developed world will issue a travel advisory. And when there's a, even much, you know, uh, bigger issue, you know, in the Europe or in America, nobody bothers to issue a travel advisory that they want to address the issue of travel advisory to be used cautiously. And you must really understand, you know, the, um, the peculiarities before you just issue a travel advisory. Most times, uh, travel advisories are issued and they exaggerate the problems more than they really are. On the sidelines, Lai Mohamed met with the Secretary General of the United Nations World Tourism Organization, Zurab Pololikashvili. Nigeria is going to hold the next regional conference, and the theme is actually on uh, tourism and the creative industry. And this meeting afforded me the opportunity to explain uh, the strong uh, points of uh, Nigeria in the area of music, fashion, film, and the creative industry generally. In the coming days, the way forward for tourism development in Africa is set to be in the front burner at the 64th UNWTO Commission for Africa. From South Island in Cape Verde, Anthony Forson, NTA News. Now back here in Nigeria, there was palpable joy among management and staff of the National Identity Management Commission, NIMSI, as the Minister of Communications and Digital Economy presented them a new condition of service approved by the President. Victor Azu reports that the document also comes with an attractive welfare package. A fully packed hall of National Identity Management Commission NIMSI personnel. Who can blame them? 
where NIMSI was established in 2007. Staff welfare was hinged on a so-called personal policy with huge constraints. This resulted in poor welfare. Personnel departed in droves to seek greener pastures elsewhere. So, as the Minister of Communications and Digital Economy mounted the podium to present a significantly improved condition of service, he was greeted with a rousing applause befitting a harbinger of good news. This is the approved NIMSI condition of service. As approved by Mr. President, we are cover a letter from this gentle boy, the Minister in charge of Communications and Digital Economy, Isa Ali Ibrahim. Thank you, sir. And this is the new salary. The minister also announced approval for infrastructure upgrade to the tune of over 25 billion naira, all of which the director general of NIMSI says is motivation to achieve more. With these two things uh, approved, then it means that every person is going to get his or his own identity. With approval in the bag, NIMSI staff can now salivate in anticipation of actual pay. In Abuja, Victor Azul, NTA News. You're watching the news at 10 on NTA News 24. Stay with us. More reports after this break. For now, the best and most efficient way to avoid getting infected is through regular hygienic and sanitary practices as well as social distancing. As individuals, Again, apologies for the freezing of some of our images there. Let's uh, move on to other reports making the news. The federal government is planning to float another pool of funds that will facilitate the provision of affordable housing to Nigerians. Minister of Works and Housing Babatunde Fashala said this during an inspection of some completed and ongoing housing projects in Abuja. Abdullahi Mohamed reports. Sprawls of housing projects in different locations, tastes and sizes. The story is that these housing challenges are being tackled. These are some end products of the federal government's drive to meet the housing needs across the country through direct intervention and private-public partnerships. Proud of the outcome of the Buhari-led administration's housing policies and a renewed drive for accelerated results, the Minister of Works and House during this tour let another cat out of the bag. So I'm going back to do the, the backroom work about possibly how to create a national housing board that housing developers can access at very reasonable rates. But that's something I'll be engaging my colleague the Minister of Finance uh, and uh, also is in charge of fiscal policy and hopefully she will be able to also engage this Governor of Central Bank who controls our monetary policy. This development, private sector housing developers say, is the icing on the cake as far as the provision of affordable housing is concerned. It is the business of private developers to provide houses to the citizens of a country. The government role is to provide an enabling environment for the private sector to strive. For many of those who are quick to sow their seeds into the various housing programs, it's harvest time. In Abuja, Abdullah Mohammed, NT News. Let's shift focus now to health and safety matters. And the Minister of Health, Dr. Osagi Ehaniri, has assured Nigerians that efforts are ongoing to bring to an end the industrial action by resident doctors. The minister stated this at the inauguration of the Southwest Traditional Leaders Committee on Primary Health Care under the National Primary Health Care Development Agency. Femi Afariogun reports that the inauguration was held at the Oni's Palace in Ileife, Oshun State. The inauguration of the Southwest Traditional Leaders Committee on Primary Health Care is an answer to the prayers of National Primary Health Care Development Agency to further improve the country's health care system. We are therefore looking forward to benefiting from your enormous influence in the communities to change 
positively the primary health care indices in the southwest zone. The Minister of Health, Dr. Osagi Enaire, disclosed that a standard primary health care center will be built and made functional each in all states across the southwest as a model and the location will be decided by the committee. The first and the greatest battle which we have to fight, Your Royal Majesty, is a battle against ignorance, which is responsible for furthering many diseases. Our primary health care centers are going to be platforms to educate, enlighten, and build awareness among the people. He gave an assurance that frantic efforts are on to end the industrial action by resident doctors. The Chairman Southwest Traditional Leaders Committee on Primary Health Care and also Onio Fife, Oba Adeyeye Enito Oguusi, commended the federal government for the initiative. Oni appealed to resident doctors to call off their strike, noting that this is not the best time as Nigeria is currently battling with COVID-19 pandemic. See again to appeal to you that you should step in further for the doctors, it's by the side, to go back to work so that uh, our health situation in Nigeria won't continue to deplore in a very bad state. I know you're doing your best with your entire team, but I want to appeal to you. The event was attended by representatives of World Health Organization, UNICEF and other stakeholders in the health sector. From Ife, Femi, Afayogun, NTA News. And on COVID-19, the Nigeria Centre for Disease Control, NCDC, has confirmed 631 additional cases of the virus in Nigeria. The latest figures show that Lagos tops the chart with 172 new cases, followed by Oyo recording 93, Rivers records 72, Edo 63, Katsina 29, Abia 26, the FCT and Kano recorded 23 new cases each. Other states include Bayosa and Ogun recording 20 new cases each, Ekiti 18, Anambra and Delta 16 cases as Oshun records 14. Imo recorded 11 new cases, Benue 6, Enugu 4, Jigawa and Niger 2, while there was a single case in Nasarawa State. Nigeria now has a total of 193,644 confirmed cases, out of which 179,294 have been treated and discharged. The death toll stands at 2,488. And talking politics now, the All Progressives Congress Caretaker and Extraordinary Convention Planning Committee says any member who takes the party to court will be sanctioned. This was disclosed during the inauguration of the party's local government congresses committees at the Buhari House National Secretariat of the party. Saluho Abdullahi Gwanara reports. The National Secretary APC Caretaker and Extraordinary Convention Planning Committee, John James Akpaudwede, has said that the committee, under the leadership of Governor May Malabuni, will not lose focus and will pursue with vigor its mandate of giving the party a formidable leadership structure at all levels. He urged party members to work with the committees to elect executives at the local government congresses scheduled to hold on Saturday, September 4, 2021. We also want to use this opportunity to retract the resolution of NEC of our party to severely sanction members and their sponsors who take the party to court. His Excellency Arumai Balabuni is determined to carry out the president's instruction, which is to build the party bottom up. The process has reached an advanced stage. United we stand, united we go for victory. We will continue to represent our great party, Mr. President, and the Nigerian people. We are progressives. The party says it remains committed to entrenching democratic practices and promise to ensure free and credible congresses that will culminate to the national convention in Abuja, Salihu Abdullahi Gwanara, NTA News. 
Nasrallah State Governor Abdullahi Sule has led a high-powered delegation to Fatho State to commiserate with the government and people over the recent attacks in the state. He sympathized with the people of Plateau State, particularly those who lost loved ones, property, and he delivered an official condolence letter as well as an undisclosed cash donation to assist those affected. The governor said it was painful to see the rich history of Plateau State, known for its hospitality, serenity, tolerance, and excellence being jeopardized by criminal activities using religion, ethnicity, and politics. Sule recalled with nostalgia his growing days in Jos, where people were united and loved one another irrespective of their differences. He wondered how people allowed politics of hatred and religious bigotry to take pride over peaceful coexistence and humanity. Responding, Governor Simon Lalong thanked the government and people of Nasrawa State for their support and solidarity, which affirmed the eternal bond that exists between the two states. He told Governor Abdullahi Sule that what happened in the recent attacks was pure criminality, which must not be given any other name for convenience or cover-up. He said the security agencies have made arrests, and those arrests will be those arrested will be diligently prosecuted. Lalong decried the misuse of the social media and some parts of the traditional media by some citizens, particularly the youths, who propagate falsehood, panic, and hate speech. He said this has led to the demarketing of Plateau State. Meanwhile, Chief of Defence Staff General Lucky Irabo has asked journalists to dwell more on issues of national unity and shun reports that may incite violence. He gave the charge in Joss while addressing newsmen on his working visits to Plateau State. Zenrit Dingum reports. General Lucky Rabo says his visit to Plateau State is part of efforts by the military's high command in finding practical and sustainable solutions to the recurring unrest in parts of the state. The military, we are part and parcel of the society. We came out from the society. We're only an instrument of, of, of value addition. We're only an instrument of, 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 of bringing solutions to issues that have to do with violence around us. Briefing journalists during his visit, the Chief of Defence Staff clarified reasons for merging the activities of the three division and Operation Safe Haven under one commander. And I felt that it was necessary for us to combine the resources available to the division with those available to Operation Safe Haven under a single leadership for it to be more effective. We have identified that there are that that we need to do more with respect to early warning and early response mechanism. While in Joss, General Irabo met with traditional rulers of the affected communities to condole with them and spelt out the role of citizens in peace building. After little information we get, we should let your people on ground. No. The Chief of Defense Staff restated his commitment to ending the spate of killings. In Joss, Zen Redding Moon, NTA News. You are on to the news at 10 on NTA News 24. We'll have more reports after this break. Stay with us. Thank you.